In this video, we're going to introduce the subject of cryptography, which is, as we'll talk about, fundamental to ensuring confidentiality and integrity uh, in systems. Before we do that, I'm just going to mention this guy, who is an example of a non-fungible token uh, and comes at potentially great cost because you can buy these creatures which are guaranteed to be unique and certified by being placed on an Ethereum blockchain. If you're interested, have a look at it, but it's all the rage in the art world at the moment um, from various people creating non-fungible tokens. The three things that we want you to take away from these videos are, first of all, understanding how cryptography is actually a control for confidentiality and integrity and how we achieve that, how achieving encryption relies on the um, concepts of confusion and diffusion and what they mean and how they are, operate. And then finally, looking at modern ciphers, uh, symmetric and asymmetric cryptography and the problem of management of keys in those types of cryptography. First of all, some history. We're not going to start with Julius Caesar, although that's the first type of code uh, or cipher that we're going to consider. Uh, he was born in 100 BC. But um, turn to the Greeks, first of all, and Herodotus, who in 425 BC talks in his book, The Histories, about a Greek called Demaratus, who was actually exiled from Greece and uh, to Persia and was wanting to warn his fellow Greeks why he wanted to do that after being exiled is a good question, but they were about the Persians were about to attack, um, led by Xerxes, and Demaratus used a method of writing a message, a warning on a board, and then covering that with wax. The messenger then passed through the checkpoints, got to the Greek officials, and they worked out that they simply had to melt the wax to reveal the message. And this is the concept of steganography, um, the idea of hiding messages in some way. Now in modern steganography, we do that within digital images and sound, um, but it really can be used in any type of object. The Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese, uh, applied the same principles by writing messages on silk, scrunching that silk up, covering it in wax, and then swallowing it to evade reading. Now Caesar sort of really started the ball rolling by using what was called a substitution cipher um, for protecting his messages from interception by the enemy. So what he did was to replace letters and here we're going to introduce some terminology. Uh, when we talk about the original message we talk about plain text and when we talk about the encoded message we talk about cipher text. So we take each letter of the plain text and we shift it by three positions uh, to the left. And so an A becomes an X, a B becomes a Y, um, C becomes Z, uh, D becomes an A, etc. And so we can see the example here of the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog being uh, encrypted using this cipher um, basically into that message. This type of substitution cipher is called is known as ROT3 because we rotate um, by three. And we can rotate by any number of uh, characters. And if we really wanted to, we could in include numbers and other characters and then rotate by that number as well. The point being that it's a circular process, so it all, always wraps upon, um, back on itself. To decipher it, it's very simple. We just right shift the ciphertext characters by the same amount, and in this case, that's three. Now, I won't go through the maths, but uh, um, as I promised, you wouldn't necessarily have to do any in this unit, but uh, essentially, this is generalized to what is a very simple formula. And here we sort of see that N is the key, and if, if we want to encrypt and um, a function of X, then essentially we take x, which is the plain text letter, we add n, and then we mod 26 um, here. So if you're not familiar with uh, 
uh, modular arithmetic, then it's actually not that hard, but there are plenty of videos to have a look at that. What's simpler, of course, is to use something like a cipher, Caesar cipher wheel, where the inner circle just rotates the number of time places that you want to shift, and then you look up the letters in that way. But if you're going to code it, then you would have to use the modular approach um, outlined previously. So for Julius Caesar, the cipher worked, and um, in part it was because most of his enemies were actually illiterate and couldn't read in the first place. However, uh, for those that could and could employ uh, cryptanalysis, the process of analyzing um, cipher in ciphered text, uh, we can actually use um, brute force. Um, it's not that hard because we can just decrypt the thing using 1 to 25 as a shift and search for meaningful text. And that's the actually the easiest way of doing that. Um, or if it's a more complicated cipher, and this is used in other types of cipher uh, cryptanalysis, we can look at things like letter frequency. So in English, uh, each letter uh, occurs a certain percentage of times. And what we can do with the cipher text is to analyze um, the frequency that they appear in the text and then mat try and match that up. And then we can get an idea of which letters are substituted um, with what other letters. Now, of course, that relies on having sufficient ciphertext, and we'll see there are various techniques for um, going through that. So the person who came up with cryptanalysis is a, an Arab called Al-Kindi, um, and that, he wrote a book called The Manuscript on Deciphering Cryptographic Messages in 870 AD. Uh, not only used letter frequencies, but also noted that double letters and two to three letter words, so uh, digrams and trigrams, uh, occurred with a certain frequency as well. So that's the combinations of uh, particular letters that have a, a frequency. So a little bit of terminology here. Cryptology is the discipline of studying cryptography and cryptanalysis, so both of them together. And the term is derived from the Greek cryptos, which is hidden, and logos, which is word, so the hidden word. Codes, in fact, are a mapping of one representation of information for another, and they operate on a semantic level of information. So it's not really um, a cryptographic, cryptographic process as such. So Morse code, for example, turns characters into dots and dashes and also used other codes as abbreviations. So in the war, for example, you would have used code words to stand for uh, operations that um, occurred. And that was the common use of code words. Of course, once you know somebody understood that what a code word actually represented, then they, that was then broken. Computer codes like ASCII, which is a way of representing uh, characters as um, binary or digital um, numbers, um, is another way of representing a code and Unicode um, extends that um, computer code to uh, include things like emojis. So for example, the smiley is represented by the Unicode number in hex of 1F600. So if you use that number, uh, gave it to a computer, it would know that, that what you were actually talking about was a smiley face. Ciphers, on the other hand, are algorithms that operate on syntax and are semantic agnostic. So codes, you have to know the meanings of what you're actually talking about for it to make sense. Whereas ciphers, um, don't worry, don't care about what the text is about. They just operate on the actual syntax, the actual characters themselves. So a substitution cipher um, using multiple substitution alphabets is called a polyalphabetic cipher. And uh, one ex good example of that was one called Visionaire cipher, uh, which, who, which was credited to Visionaire, but was actually invented by an Italian, Giovanni Battista Bellasso, in 1553. So it was, as I said, misattributed to Blaise de Visionaire, but it's commonly called uh, the Visionaire cipher and Belasso is forgotten by all 
the others um, apart from cryptographers who still remember where it came from. So this works by using a repeating keyword and this is sort of important because it introduces the concept of a key uh, which is central to all other types of uh, cryptography. So in this case letters are shifted by the number code of the letter in the key. So if we have the plain text hacking is fun the actual underlying code um, of those letters is 7, 0, 2, 10, 8 and so on. That's their positions within the alphabet. And then we have the uh, key which is cats and they have uh, their numeric representation. And what we can do then is actually then shift the original um, plain text by the shift uh, of the key uh, to arrive at the new ciphertext. So H becomes a J, A um, is encoded with an A and that becomes stays the same. C becomes um, shifted by 19 to become a V and so on and so forth and we get the ciphertext. Now obviously with repeating keys um, a lot of it is dependent on the length of the keys and we'll um, look at that and how, what impact that has um, later on. So we can encode things using a visionaire table and, um, and actually as it turns out a visionaire table is basically just a series of Caesar ciphers. So to use we find the letter on the plain text along the top row and then the corresponding letter of the key on the side column and then take the letter that intersects. So that is fairly straightforward. So here we would take, for example, a G, and then if it was uh, encoded with cats, um, it, we would then look up the C, and it creates an I, and that's relatively easy to implement. Breaking Visionaire, uh, doing the cryptanalysis on it, um, is re again reasonably uh, straightforward. However, um, this was a problem for a long time um, and the part in part because we couldn't use frequency analysis anymore um, because it uses uh, multiple possible ciphertext letters it's not uh, the same uh, because we're using a key but a guy called Friedrich Kaczynski in 1863 developed an attack strategy where he looked for repeated use of the same key to estimate the key length and uh, for example here crypto is short for cryptography and we have a key ABCD which is repeated and then looking at the ciphertext he determined that the reputations are 16 characters apart and so the key, key length is actually 16, 8, 4, 2 or 1 and then once you have the key length you can look at them using frequency analysis of the individual Caesar ciphers. There are a couple of other types of attack strategies um, which I'll leave to you as an exercise if you're interested. But the basic principle of this was to, uh, the cryptanalysis was that we couldn't use frequency analysis initially until you actually worked out the repetition of the key length. So one of the most secure, and is still one of the most secure ways of um, encrypting um, a uh, plain text message is the use of one-time pads and in fact uh, it's actually uh, known as being perfectly secure and we'll come to that in a second but essentially we use um, longer shift words and shorter messages to make frequency analysis much more difficult uh, to crack the message so a one-time pad is a list of random shifts. So essentially it's uh, a um, encryption key that is the size or greater than the message itself. Um, now the important thing is, is that this is uncrack uncrackable because of two important properties. Shifts won't ever fall into a pattern because the pad is longer than the message and the frequency distribution is uniform because the shifts are random. However, there's some caveats there. 
So as I said, one-time pads are known as being perfectly secure, and that was uh, a definition by Claude Shannon, who came up with a lot of information theory um, and is sort of known as the father of information theory in 1949 uh, in a, a paper called Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems. Um, some of the stuff that he worked on was classified um, and has subsequently been unclassified, but he worked at Bell System Labs. The principle is that if the key is perfectly random, then the potential number of encrypted messages is the same as the number of potential keys and the number of messages, which is um, a very, very large number. One of the problems with this, though, is that pseudo-random keys will result in repeating patterns, and so a smaller subset of encrypted messages. And this is one of the big problems in cryptography, is how do you actually ensure uh, real randomness when you're generating keys because pseudo randomness actually where uh, tends to repeat this is just a uh, feature of these types of functions that generate supposedly random numbers there's a good illustration of that in a um, videos on YouTube if you look at the repeating patterns for pseudo random keys There are some other problems with one-time pads. Uh, there are practical limitations. You have to need to have a large number of random keys. You need to distribute those keys to the senders and receivers, and you need to protect them from discovery. So uh, again, in, in sort of espionage uh, circles, uh, one-time pads would have been used. The agents would have been provided with a, literally with a pad with the, the written random codes on it, and that would have been used. Uh, to encrypt and decrypt uh, messages that were sent from their controllers. Uh, this is sort of a general principle and problem of uh, modern systems and one way of dealing with it, as we're going to see, is using public key infrastructure. One way of actually dealing with this um, uh, and a solution that the Germans came up with um, at the end by the end of World War One and uh, and further developed into World War Two uh, was a, a machine called the Enigma machine and this is quite a complicated machine a series of a novel and a film uh, which is well worth watching uh, with Benedict Cumberbatch in and uh, uh, and basically about how Alan Turing worked uh, at Bletchley Park in the UK to crack the Enigma machine and thereby prevent the Germans from uh, uh, launching a number of uh, deadly attacks and potentially turning, you know, having a big factor in the turning of the tide of war. But uh, the machine consists of a plug board that switches letters so A to F to G to K to L to M, and a set of three or more rotors that are chosen from a larger set with 26 positions of in each rotor. And essentially how you would determine um, how you could encrypt and decrypt a message is by sharing what these settings with the party that you were communicating with. So the plug board settings, you can see that in the picture at the front, the set of rotors at the back, uh, the ring settings and the initial position that it starts with. So lots of variables, lots of things that change. And each time a character is typed, the rotor turns and the characters on each rotor are added together to form the substitution. So there's an emulator online that you can have a look at if you want to play with it. Um, but it's, as I said, it's actually quite a complicated process. Uh, it's interesting how, in fact, they actually cracked the enigma, but uh, um, not a subject for today. In a transposition um, cipher, we change the order of characters in the ciphertext without making any substitution. So if we take the message, now run along and don't get into mischief, I'm going out, we pad it with four uh, X's and arrange it as a grid. And so we can now take the columns to create the ciphertext. So we take the first column, NNOG, and add that, and then ODMO, 
and then uh, so on and so forth. And that's called a transposition cipher.